Hello there. It's my great joy to welcome you back. This is Digging Deeper Day number 337. Today we read Joel 1 and 2, our first reading in Isaiah 44 and 2 Timothy 2. So let's open to Joel chapter 1. I feel the need to comment about chapter 9 of Esther and how the Jews got rid of their enemies. Remember that those Jews were not Christians. I know how silly that sounds, but it is actually a common supposition among naive Christians. The revelation of God's will did not come all at once and the Jews did not have the pleasure of knowing what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount or other pertinent New Testament passages. They certainly did not get rid of their enemies, except in the short run. All the relatives of the enemies slain raised up succeeding generations of people who hated the Jews even more fiercely than the first enemies did. We Christians must read Esther 9, remembering how the Jews had been slaughtered and then taken away from their land by force and put into slavery in Babylonia. It is just amazing to me how the cycle of getting rid of enemies has continued, right up to Hitler, the modern Haman, and right up to the conflicts in the Middle East today. The cycle will stop, and real peace will only happen when the true king returns. Joel is the second book of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. We read the first one, Hosea, about two months ago. From now until the end of the year, we'll start every day with a reading in the minor prophets. Joel's name means Yahweh is God. It is quite possible that Joel is one of the earliest of the prophets. He is called the prophet of Pentecost, since Peter quoted from Joel in his speech in Acts 2. The occasion of Joel's message was a devastating plague of locusts which foreshadows the day of the Lord, which is a time not for comfort for God's people, but for punishment because of their sins. Joel chapter 1 This is the Lord's message to Joel, son of Pethuel. Heading, The People Mourn the Destruction of the Crops Pay attention, you older people. Everyone in Judah, listen. Has anything like this ever happened in your time or the time of your ancestors? Tell your children about it. They will tell their children, who in turn will tell the next generation. Swarm after swarm of locusts settled on the crops. What one swarm left, the next swarm devoured. Wake up and weep, you drunkards. Cry, you wine drinkers. The grapes for making new wine have been destroyed. An army of locusts has attacked our land. They are powerful and too many to count. Their teeth are as sharp as those of a lion. They have destroyed our grapevines and chewed up our fig trees. They have stripped off the bark till the branches are white. Cry, you people, like a young woman who mourns the death of the man she was going to marry. There is no grain or wine to offer in the temple. The priests mourn because they have no offerings for the Lord. The fields are bare. The ground mourns because the grain is destroyed. The grapes are dried up and the olive trees are withered. Grieve, you farmers. Cry, you that take care of the vineyards, because the wheat, the barley, yes, all the crops are destroyed. The grapevines and fig trees have withered, all the fruit trees have wilted and died. The joy of the people is gone. Put on sackcloth and weep, you priests who serve at the altar. 
go into the temple and mourn all night. There is no grain or wine to offer your God. Give orders for a fast, call an assembly, gather the leaders and all the people of Judah into the temple of the Lord your God and cry out to him. The day of the Lord is near, the day when the Almighty brings destruction. What terror that day will bring! We look on helpless as our crops are destroyed. There is no joy in the temple of our God. The seeds die in the dry earth. There is no grain to be stored, and so the empty granaries are in ruins. The cattle are bellowing in distress, because there is no pasture for them. The flocks of sheep also suffer. I cry out to you, Lord, because the pastures and trees are dried up as though a fire had burned them. Even the wild animals cry out to you because the streams have become dry. Joel chapter 2 Heading The Locusts as a Warning of the Day of the Lord Blow the trumpet! Sound the alarm on Zion, God's sacred hill. Tremble, people of Judah. The day of the Lord is coming soon. It will be a dark and gloomy day, a black and cloudy day. The great army of locusts advances like darkness spreading over the mountains. There has never been anything like it, and there never will be again. Like fire, they eat up the plants. In front of them, the land is like the Garden of Eden, but behind them, it's a barren desert. Nothing escapes them. They look like horses. They run like war horses. As they leap on the tops of the mountains, they rattle like chariots. They crackle like dry grass on fire. They are lined up like a great army ready for battle. As they approach, everyone is terrified, every face turns pale. They attack like warriors, they climb the walls like soldiers. They all keep marching straight ahead and do not change direction or get in each other's way. They swarm through defenses and nothing can stop them. They rush against the city. They run over the walls, they climb up the houses, and go in through the windows like thieves. The earth shakes as they advance, the sky trembles, the sun and the moon grow dark, and the stars no longer shine. The Lord thunders commands to his army, the troops that obey him are many and mighty. How terrible is the day of the Lord! Who will survive it? Heading A Call to Repentance But even now, says the Lord, repent sincerely and return to me with fasting and weeping and mourning. Let your broken heart show your sorrow. Tearing your clothes is not enough. Joel Speaks Come back to the Lord your God. He is kind and full of mercy. He is patient and keeps his promise. He is always ready to forgive and not punish. Perhaps the Lord your God will change his mind and bless you with abundant crops. Then you can offer him grain and wine. Blow the trumpet on Mount Zion, give orders for a fast, and call an assembly. Gather the people together, prepare them for a sacred meeting. Bring the old people, gather the children, and the babies too. Even newly married couples must leave their homes and come. The priests, serving the Lord between the altar and the entrance of the temple, must weep and pray. Have pity on your people, Lord. Do not let other nations despise us and mock us by saying, Where is your God? Heading 
God restores fertility to the land. Then the Lord showed concern for his land and had mercy on his people. He answers them, Now I'm going to give you grain and wine and olive oil, and you will be satisfied. Other nations will no longer despise you. I will remove the locust army that came from the north and will drive some of them into the desert. Their front ranks will be driven into the Dead Sea, their rear ranks into the Mediterranean. Their dead bodies will stink. I will destroy them because of all they have done to you. Fields, do not be afraid, but be joyful and glad because of all the Lord has done for you. Animals, don't be afraid. The pastures are green, the trees bear their fruit, and there are plenty of figs and grapes. Be glad, people of Zion. Rejoice at what the Lord your God has done for you. He has given you the right amount of autumn rain. He has poured down the winter rain for you and the spring rain as before. The threshing places will be full of grain. The pits beside the presses will overflow with wine and olive oil. I will give you back what you lost in the years when swarms of locusts ate your crops. It was I who sent this army against you. Now you will have plenty to eat and be satisfied. You will praise the Lord your God who has done wonderful things for you. My people will never be despised again. Then, Israel, you will know that I am among you, and that I, the Lord, am your God, and there is no other. My people will never be despised again. Heading, The Day of the Lord The Lord continues to speak. Afterward I will pour out my Spirit on everyone. Your sons and daughters will proclaim my message, your old people will have dreams, and your young people will see visions. At that time I will pour out my Spirit, even on servants, both men and women. I will give warnings of that day in the sky and on the earth. There will be bloodshed, fire, and clouds of smoke. The sun will be darkened, and the moon will turn red as blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. But all who ask the Lord for help will be saved. As the Lord has said, Some in Jerusalem will escape, those whom I choose will survive. Let's turn now for the first time to Isaiah 44. According to the NLT, in Isaiah 43, verse 14, God says, For your sakes I will send an army against Babylon, forcing the Babylonians to flee in those ships they are so proud of. This is a very difficult verse to translate, and GNT's translation can also be defended. It says, Israel's holy God, the Lord who saves you, says, To save you I will send an army against Babylon. I will break down the city gates, and the shouts of her people will turn into crying. Wow, how different. God said that the people of Israel had become tired of God and tired of bringing sacrifices. God will do something new. In verse 25, he said, Yes, I alone will blot out your sins for my own sake and will never think of them again. These frequently quoted words are from the beginning of the chapter. Do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. 
Isaiah 44 The Lord says, Listen now, Israel, my servant, my chosen people, the descendants of Jacob. I am the Lord who created you. From the time you were born, I have helped you. Do not be afraid. You are my servant, my chosen people, whom I love. I will give water to the thirsty land and make streams flow on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your children and my blessing on your descendants. They will thrive like well-watered grass, like willows by streams of running water. One by one people will say, I am the Lord's. They will come to join the people of Israel. They each will mark the name of the Lord on their arms and call themselves one of God's people. The Lord who rules and protects Israel, the Lord Almighty, has this to say, I am the first, the last, the only God. There is no other God but me. Could anyone else have done what I did? Who could have predicted all that would happen from the very beginning to the end of time? Do not be afraid, my people. You know that from ancient times until now I have predicted all that would happen, and you are my witnesses. Is there any other God? Is there some powerful God I have never heard of? Isaiah speaks. All those who make idols are worthless, and the gods they prize so highly are useless. Those who worship these gods are blind and ignorant, and they will be disgraced. It does no good to make a metal image to worship as a god. Everyone who worships it will be humiliated. The people who make idols are human beings and nothing more. Let them come and stand trial. They will be terrified and will suffer disgrace. The metal worker takes a piece of metal and works with it over a fire. His strong arm swings a hammer to pound the metal into shape. As he works, he gets hungry, thirsty, and tired. The carpenter measures the wood. He outlines a figure with chalk, carves it out with his tools, and makes it in the form of a man, a handsome human figure, to be placed in his house. He might cut down cedars to use, or choose oak or cypress wood from the forest. Or he might plant a laurel tree and wait for the rain to make it grow. A person uses part of a tree for fuel and part of it for making an idol. With one part he builds a fire to warm himself and bake bread, with the other part he makes a god and worships it. With some of the wood he makes a fire, he roasts meat, eats it, and is satisfied. He warms himself and says, How nice and warm! What a beautiful fire! The rest of the wood he makes into an idol, and then he bows down and worships it. He prays to it and says, You are my god, save me! Such people are too stupid to know what they're doing. They close their eyes and minds to the truth. Let's open now to 2 Timothy 2. What was the spiritual gift that Timothy received when Paul placed his hands on him? Paul wanted Timothy to fan that gift into flame. Is there a clue to what the gift was in the next verse? For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. Paul says, I know the one in whom I trust, and I'm sure that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until the day of his return. What has Paul entrusted to the Lord? It is a clue when Paul says, Through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us, carefully guard the precious truth that has been entrusted to you. 
2 Timothy 2 As for you, my son, be strong through the grace that is ours in union with Christ Jesus. Take the teachings that you have heard from me and proclaim them in the presence of many witnesses and entrust them to reliable people who will be able to teach others also. Take your part in suffering as a loyal soldier of Christ Jesus. A soldier on active duty wants to please his commanding officer and so does not get mixed up in the affairs of civilian life. An athlete who runs in a race cannot win the race unless he obeys the rules. The farmer who has done the hard work should have the first share of the harvest. Think about what I'm saying, because the Lord will enable you to understand it all. Remember Christ Jesus, who was raised from death, who was a descendant of David, as is taught in the good news I preach. Because I preach the good news, I suffer and I'm even chained like a criminal. But the word of God is not in chains, and so I endure everything for the sake of God's chosen people, in order that they too may obtain the salvation that comes through Christ Jesus and brings eternal glory. This is a true saying. If we have died with him, we shall also live with him. If we continue to endure, we shall also rule with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are not faithful, he remains faithful, because he cannot be false to himself. Remind your people of this and give them a solemn warning in God's presence not to fight over words. It does no good but only ruins the people who listen. Do your best to win full approval in God's sight as a worker who is not ashamed of his work, one who correctly teaches the message of God's truth. Keep away from profane and foolish discussions which only drive people farther away from God. Such teaching is like an open sore that eats away the flesh. Two men who have taught such things are Hemonius and Philetos. They have left the way of truth and are upsetting the faith of some believers by saying that our resurrection has already taken place. But the solid foundation that God has laid cannot be shaken, and on it are written these words, The Lord knows those who are His, and those who say that they belong to the Lord must turn away from wrongdoing. In a large house there are dishes and bowls of all kinds, Some are made of silver and gold, others of wood and clay, some for special occasions, others for ordinary use. Those who make themselves clean from all the evil taught by false teachers will be used for special purposes, because they are dedicated and useful to their master, ready to be used for every good deed. Run away to escape from the passions of youth. Strive for righteousness, full belief, love, and peace, together with those who, with a pure heart, call out to the Lord for help. But keep away from foolish and ignorant arguments. You know that they end up in quarrels. As the Lord's servant, you must not quarrel. You must be kind toward all, a good and patient teacher, who is gentle as you correct your opponents, for it may be that God will give them the opportunity to repent and come to know the truth. And then they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil, who caught them and made them obey his will. 
Please join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, please keep us securely placed on the two great foundation stones that Paul mentioned. First, you know who your children are, and this means that you will lead them away from false beliefs and practices. And secondly, we must turn away from wrongdoing. Lord, make it a holy desire within us to be one of your special vessels, the ones you use for special purposes. May we be clean and ready today to be used by you for any good deed that will glorify you. And we note, Lord, that we are not to stand up in the face of youthful passions, but to run away. Nail that verse permanently in our memory, because even we old people need to run from such passions. Lord, I thank you for the fellowship in my own local church, and I pray that each of my listeners will have a similar place where fellow believers join together in love and without arguments. May they patiently encourage one another to more fully believe in you and live lives that glorify you.